Hello and welcome to section 9, Delivering Published Applications with Horizon. In this section, we're going to look at how to install and configure Horizon to deliver published applications to our end users. So what are we going to learn in this section? In this section, we're going to take a closer look at how Horizon can deliver published applications. We'll start off by looking at the architecture and how to size an environment. Next, we will start the installation process by configuring an RDSH server to run the application sessions along with configuring which applications to publish and installing the Horizon agent to enable RDSH to communicate with the connection server. The connection server will act as the broker to the application sessions that are hosted on the RDSH server. Next, we will configure the Horizon elements of the solution, creating a farm consisting of the RDSH server and then an application pool that contains the apps that Horizon users can then access. Once configured, we will look at how you load balance application sessions across multiple RDSH servers, before finally testing that everything works by logging in as an end user and launching a published application. So now let's move on to the first video of this section and let's look at how the architecture of publishing apps with Horizon works and how to size an environment. So in this video, we're going to talk specifically about the architecture and how to size an environment, as well as how application sessions are load balanced using the default method in Horizon. Before we get into the detail, let's start with a quick introduction by defining what exactly we mean by remote application sessions and how is that different to VDI. As we discussed in previous sections of this course, this feature is often referred to as server-based computing or SPC or even remote desktop services. With remote applications, the difference is that the applications are installed and run on the Windows servers configured with the RDSH role and are using a multi-user version of that application to create individual user sessions. A user would then connect to their own individual, separate and protected session of that application instead of connecting to an instance of an operating system that contains the applications as they would in a VDI environment. As everything is running in the data center, users would connect to the session via a terminal or thin client. And in fact, SBC or server-based computing is sometimes referred to as thin client computing. So why use this model over VDI? A use case for this could be a call center worker who just uses a couple of different applications. It's far easier from a management perspective to just give them the applications they require rather than a full-blown virtual desktop. Another use case is the ability to launch applications using the Horizon client running on a device that wouldn't normally be able to run that application. For example, you could run the real version of Microsoft Word on your iPad by using the Horizon client for iOS and the published version of Word. So how does the hosted application feature work? Let's take a look at that high level. To begin with, as with connecting to any view-delivered virtual desktop machine, you launch the view client and log into the connection server by entering the details of the view connection server that you want to connect to. The connection server responds with a login box. When you enter your username and password, this is returned to the connection server. The credentials entered are then authenticated against Active Directory. Once authenticated, the client sends a get launch items request to the connection server to request a list of all the entitled application sessions, applications and desktops for that user. The response contains the following details. It contains the app session, the desktop and the application, and then the absolute path to the icons. The client then fetches any icons it doesn't have already cached through HTTPS using the paths that were provided by the connection server when it sent the response. Access to icon uniform resource identifiers or URIs needs to be authenticated. The connection server performs an entitlement check and only returns an icon if that user is entitled to at least one application that has an icon associated with it. For applications that don't have any icons, the client will provide a default icon. A list of entitled desktop and application pools is then displayed to the end user in the view client. The end user then double clicks on an application or a desktop, enabled to launch it. The connection is made and is launched using the AppTap API, and the application is delivered via the delivery protocol, whether that's PC over IP or Blast Extreme, to the end user's client device. So let's look at RDSH sizing. For the total memory in each RDSH server, VMware recommends that a virtual server configured as an RDSH server should be provisioned with 64 gig of memory. And in terms of CPU requirements, the VMware recommendation is to create virtual servers for RDSH roles and configure each one with four virtual CPUs. Again, make sure you don't overcommit on the number of cores. So for example, if you had a virtual machine running as an RDSH server, configured with 64 gig of memory and had heavy users hosted on it, you'd be able to host a maximum of 64 sessions on that server. 
For the hardware configuration, let's say you had a physical ESXi host server configured with a two-socket CPU that had 12 cores, so a total of 24 cores. This would allow a maximum of six RDSH servers, as we are going to provision virtual machines for the RDSH role, each with four cores, 24 cores divided by four cores, giving you the six. That would mean that the physical server would also need to be configured with 384 gig of memory in total, so 64 gig times six for each of the six individual servers. These figures are only guidelines and based on some of the VMware recommended best practice. It's always best to run an assessment on your environment to work out exactly what your optimum configuration should look like. Next, we're going to take a look at load balancing the desktop sessions and how that works. By default, which server provides the resources for the session is purely based on how many sessions are available on any given RDSH server at the time of the request. So that means when a user logs in and launches a desktop session, that session is delivered from the server that has the highest amount of free sessions available. That is to say, the one that's not the busiest. In this example, we have two RDSH servers in a farm. RDSH Server 1 can host a maximum of 100 sessions and currently has 50 of those 100 sessions active. RDSH Host Server number 2 can host a maximum of 50 sessions and currently has 25 of those 50 sessions active. Therefore, in this example, when we launch a new session, as the most free sessions are on RDSH Host Server number 1, this session will launch and be delivered by this server. This option works fine, but it's not that scientific, and how does the server know what each session is actually consuming in terms of resources? A particular host may well have enough capacity for additional sessions based on the number of sessions it has free, but what if those sessions it's already hosting are consuming vast amount of resources? This is where a second option comes in, as it uses more in-depth information to place sessions, and this is based on measuring the CPU and memory utilization of each host, rather than the number of free sessions. To enable this load balancing method, there are a number of manual steps that we need to complete, which we will work through later on in this course.